Welcome, welcome. We will let folks make their way in from the waiting room and get started in just a moment. All right. Well, welcome and thank you to everyone joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, Understanding Poll Workers, the Unsung Heroes of Our American Democracy. And a special welcome to everyone who is watching this recording. Poll workers are critically important to the functioning of American democracy. Who are they? Why do they do this work? And what is it like to do this work in our current political climate? There is an ongoing project supported by the Scholars Strategy Network that aims to understand those characteristics and experiences of poll workers here in Maine. Here to share initial findings of that project are Rob Glover, Associate Professor of Political Science and Honors at the University of Maine, Jordan LaBeouf, Associate Professor of Psychology and Honors at the University of Maine, and Carrie Levan, Assistant Professor of Government at Colby College. They are currently working on this project in collaboration with local town clerks and election administration officials in Maine, as well as the Maine Secretary of State's office, and we are delighted to have them with us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from each of our speakers first and then tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I will compile those questions, synthesize those with similar themes and ask as many of them as possible following the presentation. We ask that you not message speakers directly as we want their focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical challenges today, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous programs. Thank you again for joining us. And Rob, I am gonna turn it over to you to uh, kick things off. Great, um, thanks Kathleen. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All right, can everybody see that okay? Okay, um, so thanks so much, uh, Kathleen, and to MCV uh, for hosting us this afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, poll workers here in Maine uh, and some research that we've been doing, uh, actually uh, collected some data in conjunction with the midterm elections in November, and we've had a few months to kind of uh, sort out what we're seeing uh, and actually have a, a vision of uh, rolling out this research more broadly for the 2024 um, presidential election. Um, so I'm going to start, I'll kind of lay the foundation for um, uh, the, the project and also the importance of looking at this issue, especially right now, which is a really fraught time uh, in relation to voting in elections in the United States. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Carrie and Jordan to talk about some of our findings. I will come back at the end uh, to talk about some of the takeaway insights and policy implications. Um, so to start, um, we need to just talk about the critical importance of poll workers for American democracy, um, especially in relation to the, the somewhat fragmented and haphazard way in which we structure our elections. So um, I may be preaching to the choir here, but uh, we, we love poll workers and we recognize the tremendous importance and value of the work that they do. Um, so it, it is not hyperbole, it is not an exaggeration to say that poll workers 
alongside um, our wonderful local election officials uh, like town and city clerks here in the state of Maine, they are the glue that holds American democracy together. Uh, without these poll workers, American democracy would quite literally break down. We often gravitate towards thinking about polls and elections um, during the, you know, the presidential and congressional midterm elections, but uh, there are over half a million elected officials in the United States, and we have a slew of different um, uh, questions in which voters' perspective must be sought. So things like uh, referenda, budget initiatives, bond issues, charter revisions, and all these things require staffing. They require people power. Um, so this translates to tens of thousands of elections that must be competently and transparently administered uh, every year. So uh, poll workers are critical to our system of competently administered free and fair elections. Uh, poll workers are, are what we sometimes call in political science street level bureaucrats. They can exercise pretty significant discretion in ballot access and voter eligibility. Um, and they can shape perceptions of election integrity and trust in government generally. So, you know, if you have a, a great experience with a poll worker who's, who really knows their stuff and, and, uh, and does the job well, um, then you're going to come away from that election with a, you know, a positive perception of elections and election integrity. Uh, but if you don't have a good uh, experience, then you might not. And the issue is that they're recruited um, kind of on an ongoing basis. Like every election, town and municipal clerks have to recruit this, this army of poll workers. And they typically do this work for very little or no pay. Um, so it's, it's this kind of weird situation in which they're so, so critically important, but we don't think about them enough and we don't necessarily allocate the resources or compensate them in the ways that they should be given their absolutely critical role. Um, complicating this is the politicization of election administration in the United States. So we've seen particularly after the 2020 election, the rise of negative sentiment about election integrity, um, the, the totally unsubstantiated big lie about the 2020 presidential election, but this is filtered down to state and local races. And we see um, a massive wave of uh, proposed restrictive legislation in states across the country in terms of voter access and uh, you know, greater scrutiny of, of poll workers and uh, election workers. Um, and that's impacted the experience at the polls for local election officials and poll workers. So in 2022, there was national polling data uh, that suggested that trust in elections had actually rebounded quite a bit since its low point in 2020. Um, but there's no single monolithic narrative to who believes election misinformation and fraud. So um, these perceptions are highly shaped by partisanship. Uh, Republicans were five times more likely to say that the 2022 midterm elections had significant fraud than Democrats. And while trust in elections rebounded for Democrats pretty significantly and for independents, it actually did not with Republicans, with less than half saying that they trusted American democracy overall compared to 83% of Democrats and 58% of independents. And there's other interesting splits as well. So education matters. The more education you have, the more uh, you trusted election outcomes, the more income you have, the more you trusted election administration. Um, some interesting aspects with regard to race and ethnicity as well. So how does this affect election administration? How does it affect the experience at the polls? Uh, well, we've seen increased hostility towards what had previously been viewed as largely apolitical roles. We've seen really close scrutiny of election workers and clerks um, having volunteered at the polls in 2022 and 2020 and many years previously, uh, there were more poll watchers. There was kind of a, a more heightened sense of um, being watched and, and being scrutinized than there had been previously. And we've even seen e uh, intimidation and, and hostility, open threats. So there was a national survey done by the Brennan Center that found that 17% of clerks surveyed had experienced personal threats. Uh, one in five said that they were somewhat or very unlikely to stay in their role. And of those that said they were somewhat unlikely to stay in their role or very unlikely, one third of them cited personal threats or intimidation. Here in Maine, this has driven state legislation. So we had um, LD1821 last session, which made interfering with an election official, official a Class C crime. And it's also driven proposed federal legislation. So there was something called the Election Worker Protection Act. 
um, that would have really focused on kind of ensuring that uh, poll workers and election officials are being protected in the face of this uh, these threats and these new forms of hostility. Um, so that drives a number of things with regard to the experience of poll workers. That can shape your uh, experience at the polls. You might be more anxious going into that experience. You might even face intimidation or hostility. And that can be a challenge for our local election officials in terms of uh, recruitment. So uh, generally, and especially here in Maine, there are some structural challenges that we encounter with regard to recruiting this army of poll workers every election cycle. Um, and then we have some contextual challenges that we face in the current environment that um, are kind of heightened in, in the context of our, our current political uh, climate. So the structural challenges we probably know very well, um, one of which is age. Uh, we see that you know the, the age of people who are doing this work as poll workers, they tend to be older. And this was something that many communities faced um, in 2020 as we were conducting an election in, in the height of uh, pandemic is that older folks with more precarious health situations were kind of reluctant to engage in this work, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic. And so some of them that had done this work consistently for many election cycles kind of stepped back. Um, and thankfully we, we made it all work. Lots of folks stepped up to serve in these roles and we had a successful competently administered election, but it was a challenge. Um, so age and health concerns kind of work in tandem. Um, there's the challenge of rurality in which a lot of these um, polling places, you, know, you have to, to uh, field a staff in order to have an election. You might have a very kind of sparse population and you're um, uh, being faced with the task of, of trying to pull people in and get them to volunteer in uh, really sparsely populated communities. It's generally easier to do this in urban areas. Um, and here in Maine, there's the expectation also that we have ideological parity, right? So, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats are roughly evenly distributed in these roles. And that can create a challenge as well, um, especially in areas in which you have an overwhelming concentration of Democrats or an overwhelming concentration of Republicans. So there's certain structural challenges that are baked into the work of recruiting these poll workers. But in the, the context that we face now, this kind of uh, more hostile uh, political climate, there's some contextual challenges. So some folks are reluctant to do this work because of, because of fear, right? <laughs> they fear that they might uh, face intimidation or even violence at the polls. And so a role that they previously would have gravitated towards and, and stepped into willingly, um, they're a little bit more reluctant to do it. There's also um, the declining social value of this. So if this is something that someone does because they feel it's an important part of being a member of the community and serving their community, um, when this is an apolitical role that's viewed in the same way as volunteerism and service, then they might be willing to step into that role. But if it's viewed as something which is nefarious or they're involved in some sort of you know conspiracy or malfeasance, um, they're not necessarily going to attach the same social value to it. And so people might be viewing these roles in a slightly different way. And for those who have bought into misinformation and disinformation about elections and view this as a, you know, a process which is fraught with corruption and et cetera, um, they might just kind of distrust and disengage from the system altogether. So those might've been people who are willing to do this work and they've kind of stepped back and they're going to be involved in other ways, but not through the actual administration of elections. So this creates not only a problem for how we think about elections, but it also creates some really tangible problems for local election officials who are tasked with this incredible um, uh, challenge of staffing these elections every cycle. So we wanted to explore this. Um, and so we, we um, have been working on this project for, I guess, about a year and a half, first conceptualizing it and then executing it. And as I said, we hope to roll this out more widely in uh, 2024. Um, so essentially, we administered um, a survey to poll workers from a selection of main municipalities. We worked in Orono, in Bangor, in Fort Kent, and in Standish. Um, and we gave poll workers a pre and post survey, meaning that we surveyed them shortly before they participated as poll workers, and then we were able to survey them shortly afterwards um, around the, mid, the, the midterm election in 2022. And we wanted to know some demographic information, kind of who they were, their political affiliation, uh, you know, those sorts of issues, education, things like that. Uh, but we really wanted to know their reasons for being involved in this work. So why are they doing this work? 
what was their experience like? And, and the really interesting part is their perceptions of democracy and elections and their likelihood of future participation, not only as poll workers, but just kind of their, um, their thinking about voting in elections generally after having this, this experience. And um, as Kathleen mentioned, we got a small grant from an organization called the Scholars Strategy Network uh, to, to field this survey and do some of this work. And, and we're hoping to expand it in the 2024 presidential election. So now we're gonna share with you some of the findings. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Carrie Levan uh, down at Colby to talk to you about that. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Rob. That was a really wonderful setup to the context and sort of the, the conditions in which elections are um, being administered right now. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found in our survey with regards to who our poll workers are here in Maine. And I have some animations in my sl slides, Rob, so you're going to have to be a really great helper in clicking along. So if you click, uh, yeah, there we go. So just some things that maybe aren't very surprising to all of us, looking at uh, the age ranges for volunteers in the midterm election, uh, clearly, uh, volunteers are older, the majority coming from the baby boomer generation, ages 57 to 76, and then by Gen X, and then silent generation, and then finally Gen Zs, millennials participating at the lowest rate, kind of makes sense. They're sort of the majority of the labor force, raising families, things like that. So in terms of time, um, they have the least amount of time possibly to, to volunteer. Again, this is probably no surprise to those of you who are familiar with poll workers. Uh, the next, if you click again, Rob. Um, next, gender distribution. This may be, this was surprising to me. Uh, women are, make up the vast majority of our volunteers. Um, so maybe thinking about ways in which we can recruit more men to help out in this form of service, but 74% of our sample uh, were made up of women. Okay, next. In terms of education, uh, our volunteers were uh, more educated. So the vast majority had a college degree or higher. Um, this again makes sense when we think about what we know about other forms of civic engagement. People with higher levels of education tend to have greater resources, more time, more information. They tend to be more connected to networks that invite them to participate. And so again, this does make sense in terms of the finding that volunteers are more highly educated. Uh, and then again, maybe no surprise in terms of employment status, most of our volunteers were retired. Um, and then we have a large sample of folks who were both working full-time and part-time. Um, we could see that maybe there is some room for improvement among students. Um, so maybe thinking about ways in which we can rec uh, recruit more young people to participate. Uh, but yeah, the majority were retired. And now moving on to one of our open-ended questions. So we were interested in what were the motivating factors that sort of pushed our volunteers to, to serve as poll workers. So these were the top responses in an open-ended question. So respondents could tell us anything they wanted. And many, many respondents included multiple reasons for why they chose to serve. So they could say something like civic duty and include other reasons. But the most common response was some mention of civic duty, that this was something they were taught to do, that it was important to serve the community. So civic duty is certainly the most common reason people are explaining for why they chose to serve. Maybe not surprising in the current climate, as Rob described, uh, was there were many people who were mentioning this, this idea of a threat to democracy, that they wanted to serve to preserve democracy. Now, this can come in a couple different forms. One, it could be um, respondents who were worried about the hostility, the threat, the intimidation, and they wanted to serve to ensure that the that those threats and those worries about intimidation wouldn't manifest in, in the failure of the dem democratic process. But then there were others who were describing these worries about voter fraud, respondents who had sort of bought into the big lie, that they were worried about the legitimacy, that the votes would be counted correctly. And so 
folks who mentioned the threat to democracy in some shape or form, really it was sort of taking these two different forms. Next was this sort of curious bunch of volunteers who were describing a desire to learn. This may have been connected to the threat to democracy, but they said they really wanted to see how elections were run, to watch the process unfold. They were curious about the process. They wanted to learn about the process. So there was a good proportion of respondents who, who were interested in understanding how the sort of tangible, practical application of democracy. What did that look like? Lots of folks saying they just had the time. Um, and then the, the other two, the socialization people, fun, exciting, these were all kind of very similar responses. People talking about, oh, I wanted to be able to see old friends. I wanted to be able to meet the people in my community. And this was a great opportunity to see people come in as they voted and that they thought it would be fun and exciting. So these were some other reasons. And then finally, uh, again, sort of one of these contextual responses, people were mentioning COVID, that they had learned about a poll worker shortage, and that they wanted to step up and participate um, because of that reason. Sort of the big takeaway is that these messages around civic duties, so, you know, Rob mentioned that maybe there was some concern that people wouldn't want to volunteer because of these threats to democracy or this idea that there was something fraudulent and that it wasn't important or now that it had been politicized that they didn't want to participate because it had been corrupted somehow but but still the people who did turn out to participate as poll workers in the midterm they were consistently mentioning civic duty and this desire to uphold democracy so these types of messages are still resonating. So in terms of messages that would help recruit, these certainly are gonna be messages that are successful. And then the next question we were interested was in examining what, what were, how were folks recruited? What were the successful forms of recruitment? Um, so the most, common response where people would just, and, and this was also an open-ended question, so respondents could sort of give any answer they wanted. The most frequent was a group of volunteers who said, I just volunteered on my own. Um, and I kind of did some digging around with who these folks were. A lot of them were volunteers who had been volunteering for a long period of time. So we did in the question say, thinking back to the first time you volunteered, how were you recruited? But still, the people who tended to say, well, I just volunteered on my own, tended to be people who had been volunteering for a while. And so I'm thinking a lot of these people probably didn't remember how they were originally recruited. But, but also, there may be these people in, in our communities who are just wake up one day and say, oh, I think I'm a poll worker today. Um, but beyond that, really, the most common were some form of response that they were invited by someone that they knew or through some type of connection. So very common were uh, poll workers who mentioned family or friends. My parents always volunteered. And so I know when I grew up, I knew I wanted to do this as well. Or I have friends who always serve and they asked me to participate. Or I have a professor, Rob was named many times by his own students. Rob, uh, Professor Glover invited me to participate, so I did. So these are personal connections, people recruiting within their own networks to encourage others to participate. Another common one was that they were invited personally by the town clerk, so people who knew the town clerk or referenced the town clerk's office or that they were recruited when they were voting. So someone approached them or there was a sign up and they were encouraged to volunteer while they were while they were actually voting in a previous election. And then the next was a group of, of volunteers who mentioned being recruited from some type of formal organization. So there were a, a number of respondents who talked about, I work for the city and they offered, uh, they, they asked us to volunteer as city workers or they were active members in a political party, and so they were recruited through their political party, or through some uh, nonprofit or non-government organization like the League of Women Voters was mentioned. And so these organizations were recruiting from within. So when we look at these three categories, what the commonality, the common thread through all of them is that people were recruited personally um, through someone that they knew or through some type of connection. 
The last one that was common was some mention of the news or social media. They said, I saw a post from the, the town clerk's office online asking for volunteers, or they mentioned, I saw a story about COVID and its impacts on poll worker shortage. And so they were sort of mobilized by this, this message and information through the newspaper. Again, the big takeaway, so, oh, wait, real quick, the big takeaway here is, so if I'm a town clerk and I see this data, I would say that the most successful way to recruit is through personal approach. This is consistent in political science. We know that the best ways to mobilize voters, for example, is through personal contact. That seems to be the common pattern here is that this personal approach to recruitment is the most successful, asking people to reach into their networks or the town clerk to personally mobilize people at the polling locations. These tend to be really successful modes of, of recruitment. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, who's going to talk about some additional findings. Awesome. Thank you all for that great start. Um, I uh, get the chance to talk about some of the things that bring me hope right now in these data. Um, and so I'm excited to, to get to share some of the effects of the experiences of serving as a poll worker from among these poll workers. So as Rob mentioned, um, when he was talking about the project at the beginning, we were able to survey these folks before they participated and then after they participated. And so we got some good information, some of which we're still processing about their experiences and the extent to which they felt like uh, the process went well and where their towns might provide more support and, and those kinds of questions, which we're excited to learn more about and share in other venues. But what we have had the chance to look at is how their ideas about perceptions of the potential for fraud and about intimidation in the polls might have changed as a consequence of their experience. One of the things that we expected and hoped was that having served in an election and having seen the incredible job that our local election officials and others do, and having seen it firsthand, that they would come away from that experience recognizing how dramatically improbable or even impossible large-scale fraud would be and thus to come away with more faith in the democratic process as a result of having that participation. And um, to cut to the chase, that's actually what we saw, right? So um, I'll walk through the details of this, but in short, as is, as is probably obvious, uh, the vast majority of our participants said they had heard a great deal in the news about voter fraud. So it's not something that was flying under the radar for anybody, you know, regardless of what they were or why they were participating as a poll worker. It's something that was on their minds. But you can see here some, some rates uh, in the data of perceptions of fears of fraud or fears of intimidation um, at the beginning. So this is at time one before they have served as a poll worker. But keep in mind, many of these people have all have served before. So most of these people are not novel poll workers, but this is just over the course of this one midterm election. What we see is, reflects some of the more national data that Rob mentioned in the introduction, that Republican participants were more likely to be concerned about fraud. So this variable you're seeing on the far left is suggesting that Republicans still were, were skeptical about fraud, but endorsed more potential for there having been fraud in the 2020 election than did Democrats or independents. Uh, and relatedly, you'll see that Republicans were slightly higher in their fear about fraud in this and upcoming elections. So they both thought it might have happened and were more likely to think it might happen in the future than were Democrats or independents. Interestingly, and I think good for us, uh, nobody thought there was much of a chance of fraud having happened or happening in the future in Maine at all, regardless of party affiliation. Uh, and so there was this idea that if there is fraud, and there might be, uh, among, among some of these uh, participants, it's probably not happening in Maine. 
We also saw this interesting difference between party affiliation here on intimidation. What we saw is that Republicans were a bit less concerned about intimidation or violence happening at the polls, but that Democrats and independents were a bit more concerned about that. So this is showing some party disparity. Everybody's got a little bit of concern about things happening at the polls, but what is happening is, is differ by party, where Republicans are a little bit more concerned about fraud and Democrats are a little bit more concerned about intimidation. You can go ahead, Rob. Um, one of the things that we found was that the more experience workers had, that is the more years of experience they had volunteered, the more trust they had in main elections in particular. So this is suggesting that the more time somebody is spending in these processes, the more likely they are to see how impregnable they are here in Maine um, and for them to see them as really valid and trusting. But here's the thing that excited me most, that when we look at change from time one to time two, so before serving in this midterm election and then after serving in this midterm election, you're seeing that for these variables on the bottom of this slide here, the blue bar indicates their average of workers before, and the orange bar is the average of those same workers after. What we see is a decrease in concern about fraud, no real change in concern. You can see those bars are a little bit different, but there's no statistically reliable change there in beliefs in fraud about Maine, and that's probably because they were already so low. And then you see a decrease in beliefs about intimidation or worry about intimidation. So the takeaway here is that regardless of party, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're an independent, regardless of the kind of concern you have about elections, whether you're concerned about fraudulent voting or calculations or machines or whatever, or whether you're concerned about intimidation and violence from people at the polls, Having participated, even if you've participated before, was associated with coming away from that experience, feeling like democracy is in better shape than you might have felt before you walked in those doors that day. That's, I think, phenomenal. I think it opens the door. And Rob's going to talk a little bit about the takeaways. But to me, this is consistent with a bunch of literature that suggests that civic engagement is associated with cooperation across these kinds of party lines and a reduction in polarization. And so this suggests that when we're concerned about polarization and when we're concerned about differences across the aisle or across beliefs, that one thing we might be able to do is to encourage this kind of civic engagement um, in a way that gets people to reduce their fears about these sorts of things and kind of come together in common civic practice. So I'll pass it back to Rob to kind of talk a little bit about takeaways. Great, thanks Jordan. Uh, so we like to give you some good news on a Friday afternoon. You can walk away happy this weekend. Uh, so just to reiterate one of the points that, that Carrie emphasized, um, so for recruitment, personal outreach was by far the most effective way of recruiting poll workers. And um, also those who participate in this work are generally excited to do it in the future. We saw lots of people who had been doing this work for years and years and years and years, uh, cycle after cycle after cycle. And so Jordan's piece is really emphasizing um, the value of this work, particularly in this fraught political climate, as people might have fears about election integrity or intimidation or just the process of elections, that participating in this work, they come away with uh, kind of a better perspective. So the big takeaway insight in terms of thinking about how we move forward um, to strengthen our democracy and to shore up our uh, critically important election work and the role of poll workers is what are some ways that we can get more people involved in this work? And so we're going to throw out kind of a buffet of different options of things that we could be thinking about doing uh, to encourage this work, both because it's critically important work and it's underfunded, underfunded and under capacity, and we need it to continue to happen, but also because it has these positive beneficial impacts on people's outlook on um, democracy and the integrity of our elections. So we have some different options. Um, one of the interesting things that we've seen over the last few election cycles are um, kind of private or community level initiatives to recruit, recruit folks to do this work. And so we've been doing that, some of this here at the university. Um, 2020, when we faced a lot of poll workers who were going to 
uh, stay home because of fears about you know, um, their health and COVID-19, there were a ton of students who stepped up to play that role and they stepped up because uh, staff, faculty at the university were asking them to do that work. And so those sorts of community level programs where like you're involved in a workplace, you go to school uh, at a university or even some high schools do this work and you have somebody that you know and trust say, democracy needs you, will you step up and do this work can be really effective. Um, there's an organization called Power to the Polls and they've been doing really interesting things with um, collaborating with uh, uh, private businesses, enterprises, uh, to get them to give workers um, a paid day off so that they can do this work. And um, over the last two election cycles, they've recruited over 350,000 poll workers nationwide to do this work. So we think there's probably ways in which um, communities, uh, election workers, uh, um, uh, sorry, election officials, and then uh, private enterprises collaborating together uh, can recruit uh, students and, and employees um, to do this work. There's also been state legislation on this. There was a bill proposed by uh, Republican Senator Rick Bennett last session. It didn't pass, uh, but it's a really intriguing idea whereby state employees, folks who work for the state of Maine, would be given a paid day off if they um, committed to do at least six hours of work at the polls on, um, on election day. Um, so that's recruiting people from our, our public workforce. And it's also ensuring that if they're going to do this, they're not going to face uh, some sort of financial repercussion, right? They don't have to lose a day's wages in order to do this work. So those sorts of things, um, you know, I think those sorts of ideas are really interesting. What, what are ways that we can use, um, you know, the, the populations that we have uh, some access to, uh, to recruit them into doing this work? And not only does that address some of the recruitment issues, but it, it you would also hope that those people come away with um, a positive perspective on our elections and voting as well. And then at the federal level, um, there's been a number of pieces of legislation. There's none active that I know of right now, but in the last few sessions, um, there have been big federal pieces of legislation that focus on, uh, a lot of them sadly are kind of focused on ensuring that poll workers are safe. And so there's a lot of resources that go towards ensuring that there's adequate security and uh, infrastructure to protect poll workers and election clerks. Uh, but generally embedded in that legislation somewhere is money that's going to go usually to states and then filter down to um, municipalities or counties, depends on how the state administers its elections, to do things like recruit poll workers and to update election infrastructure. And so we think really at all levels of government and also in our community, uh, and, and in our, our own um, private engagement with our, our community and, and our workplaces, that there can be an effort to recruit more people to do this work. And it's not simply uh, filling the desperately needed you know, holes to ensure that elections are administered. It's also about what people take away from that experience and how they're thinking about elections and their integrity in voting and the electoral process walking away from that. So there's immediate value. And then there's this uh, this kind of longer term value that can address some of the issues um, that we were laying out at the outset about Americans um, faith in elections and uh, democracy overall. So uh, we're going to wrap it up there and we uh, absolutely value not only people's questions today in the conversation, but if any of you um, are interested in this work that we're going to do in the subsequent stages of work that we hope to do in towns and communities across Maine, you have our contact information. You should feel free to reach out to us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. And, and thanks to Carrie and Jordan as well. I am just so grateful to the three of you for, for doing this work and for sharing this work with us today. I want to remind everyone that later on this afternoon, you will get a follow-up email with a link to this recording and some ways that you can continue learning and, and taking action. It's not going to surprise you that the very first thing on that list is going to be sign up to be a poll worker. So we'll have the, the contact information so you can go right to your town clerk and, and volunteer to serve or, or for, to ask for other ways that you can help support elections in your town. Um, there'll also be some, some links to learn more about legislative efforts and research and other programs to really dig into this issue. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing questions with, with me through the chat. You can keep doing that and we will dig in. The, the first question is, 
where can we read this? Is your is your present is your research online? Is there um, more to come? Give us a, a status update. Um, so I'll say we we are preparing actually to have a, an op ed coming out in the Kennebec Journal. Uh, shortly, sometime in early April, I believe. So there'll be an op-ed that comes out through that. We are also in the process of writing a, um, a scholarly article that we'll be presenting at the New England Political Science Association annual conference in late April. Um, I don't know about any other plans. I'm I think we'll probably end up doing some, some policy brief information that will be posted on the Scholar Strategy Network. I'm guessing it will appear there, but the, I don't know if we have anything right now that's out in the public. Well, we will keep an eye out. And and Carrie, since you mentioned the Scholars Strategy Network, can you say a little bit more about, about what that network is and how your research fits into it? Sure. Uh, all three of us are members, and actually Jordan and Rob are the director, the main directors of the main chapter, but the Scholar Strategy Network is a national network of academics from a whole range of fields um, who study questions and try to help inform policy through our research. So a lot of us will present before state legislatures through at the federal level as well. We write op-eds to help inform the public, but the idea is really to get uh, academic scholarship into the hands of the public and to practitioners so that we can really have, um, you know, informed policy decisions being made uh, through science essentially. And all three of us are members, right? I love that. Um, and I, you know, we say all the time at, at Maine Conservation Voters that we want to follow the science, right? We want our policy to be guided by the best science and data that, that we have access to. And thank you for being part of that process to generate that science and data. We really appreciate it. Um, does so it work? Kathleen <laughs> Can I jump in just to add one more Please little do. plug then, given that and some of your some of the other folks here might be interested in this. On the Scholar Strategy Network website, there are lists of our policy briefs from folks from across the country who have done research on tons of topics. So if there is a topic, I mean, some of them are very main relevant, some are national relevant, um, you know, but there are, if you have an issue that you're interested in, you want to know more about the science on that issue um, from a policy angle, you can look there and there's a lot of great resources. That's fabulous. And everybody, I promise the link to Scholars Strategy Network will be in the follow-up email this afternoon so you can, can get right to it. Um, do you see the, the impact of that work? Can you think of a, an, can you share an example of a time that your, that research really came to bear in a, a legislative debate or policy debate at any level? I think Rob should take that one and talk about some of his work on drug policy because it's amazing and he's lovely at doing this type of advocacy. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so a colleague of mine, uh, Karen Spohr, she's a criminologist. Uh, we've been doing work on uh, policy attitudes uh, around um, drug policy for the last three years now. Um, and this is something we know is uh, changing and it's changing relatively rapidly. And unfortunately in the state of Maine, um, a lot of it is, is changing in the wake of um, tragedy and loss, right? So our overdose numbers, despite all of these policy innovations, all of these things that we're trying to do uh, to, to protect people who suffer from substance use disorder are, are not working. Um, so one thing that we did was a statewide survey on uh, people's attitudes towards um, drug policy reform, thinking about this more as a public health issue and less as kind of a punitive criminal issue, at least personal use, right? People who are um, in possession of drugs for their own personal use, not sale or trafficking. And um, what we had consistently heard from lawmakers is that, yes, you know, this is not working, but uh, we want to be really careful because Main, Mainers might not be ready for radical change here. Mainers might not be ready for some sort of dramatic change. And 
um, we did research that showed actually um, across the board, regardless of, of ideology, um, people are willing to consider pretty dramatic changes in terms of how we approach uh, uh, drug policy in this state. And increasingly, what's less relevant to one's perspective on these issues, it used to be the case that ideology or one's political party could, could predict relatively accurately where you're going to stand in these issues. Um, but here in the state of Maine, it's more about um, personal exposure to the crisis. And so do you know someone who has suffered from substance use disorder? Have you lost someone to overdose? And those sorts of factors, those sorts of like guttural personal impacts, right, that, that um, people experience, that's actually a, a much more salient predictor of where someone is going to come down on significant policy change. And as this crisis becomes more widespread and affects more people, we're starting to see those attitudes change. So we're seeing little incremental policy changes, um, uh, but potentially um, pretty significant policy change as both the population changes their attitudes and lawmakers become confident that they're not going to alienate constituents uh, or you know people in their district by coming out publicly and, and saying we need a different approach that's rooted in public health and and less rooted in um, you know criminal punitive policies. So that's a good example, and that's a great example in which um, we've been able to to meet with lawmakers and work with advocates and craft some of the um, the polling that we were doing. Uh, uh, on, on the basis of the information that they feel they need to know in order to make good public policy. And we should also just mention on this project too, uh, we were able to meet with all sorts of great town clerks who gave us suggestions for questions that should appear on the survey um, and meet with folks in the Secretary of State's office and, and get their feedback. So Maine is an absolute treasure of a state to work in, in terms of its transparency and its access to policymakers and their willingness to engage with you and uh, kind of guide you in terms of what information and um, what what data will be useful to them. Um, so that um, makes the work that we do at SSN uh, easier. That is just incredible. And, and so many interesting parts of that. I, I love the specific example of, of drug policy and how your findings sound like they're really giving lawmakers permission to think a little bit bigger and a little bit more creatively than, than perhaps they they went into the, the discussion thinking they could. Um, but also that transparency, you know, that that access and the, the fact that this can be a collaborative sort of reciprocal process where you can go to lawmakers and say, what do you need to know? And then you can actually find out. So cool. What um what policy changes do you think should should flow from the research, from this research, this particular, you know, on the poll worker attitudes and experiences. I can jump in a little bit and, and maybe others have some ideas, but I mean, I think overwhelmingly what we saw was confirmation that the work these folks are doing is so important and some suggestions that it is under supported, um, you know, and not because towns are just sitting on hordes of money and resources that they don't, you know, I mean, it, there, are, there are decisions being made that are sort of beyond this, but, um, you know, offering opportunities for people to have the time to serve, I think is one of the most important policy changes that can happen. There are lots of proposals and research on the positives and negatives of things like holidays around voting days, around paid leave for voting or for serving, like Rob was talking about happening at the state level. I think that all any policy that increases civic engagement and support for these activities uh, should be considered. And I think like Rob was talking about with the, the utility of Maine is that there is a lot of opportunity for that. There's a lot of opportunity for grassroots kind of support for those things, but there's also opportunity for top-down support from the legislature to say, all right, well, if our public are concerned about integrity of elections and participating in elections are helping shore that up, then we need to fund opportunities for people to participate in those elections and find ways to do that. That makes intuitive sense. And I love that you have the data to say it doesn't just make intuitive sense. I can prove it to you. Uh, I may just add, in addition, you know, when we were talking to town clerks, 
to create the instrument, to write the survey and asking what types of questions did they want and, and, and what answers did they need to the questions that they had. We had a variety of town clerks. Some were worried about having volunteers who themselves were election deniers, who, who themselves believed the big lie and oh, what happens if we, we have these people be a part of the system? And there was like worry that if we let them come in that they might themselves be become a problem. And of course, what we found was that that wasn't the case and they actually benefited from being included in the process and by seeing how democracy actually works and that the chances of voter fraud happening or some sort of larger fraud of miscalculating or miscounting the ballots or throwing ballots out that, the idea that that was happening or could happen, right? That being a part of the process itself changed attitudes. And I'll just say, you know, because I'm a political scientist who studies behaviors and attitudes and things like this, the fact that we found attitude shifts at all is actually a really, really big deal. What we know is that it's really hard to change attitudes and beliefs that at an early age, we get these attitudes and beliefs about the world and they very rarely change. And so the idea that we could have people who believe that fraud is happening or who are nervous about voter intimidation, these types of things. And they come into this experience believing that this is what's gonna happen. And then they change those attitudes afterwards is actually a really big deal. And I think that thinking in terms of, of this particular moment where so many Americans are worried about democratic backsliding, they're worried about the future of democracy in the country and understanding that this is actually the exact moment that we should all be engaging and participating um, as a way to solve that problem, that that in of itself is the solution. So thinking, again, just reiterating what, what Jordan said, the idea that we can find any policy that maximizes participation, that is an, as inclusive as possible, and getting participants from all ends of the spectrum is really important in, in this particular moment. Harry, thank you for making that that's so clear that it's this is a big deal and that those those attitude shifts are not necessarily um well I guess I'll just ask did you ex did you expect to get the results that you did or or what was the most surprising thing in the research that that you came up with or that you found I'll just take a carry and no from my perspective I did not I really did I mean it's so hard to change people's attitudes and and beliefs and we know that behavior is the one of the best pathways to do that and by that i mean engaging in some activity that that sort of pushes you into confronting the reality of your own attitudes and and the way the world works right so we we knew it had potential and we hoped or at least i'll speak for myself i hoped that this was the case but i really wouldn't have been terribly surprised if i saw that people who already thought there wasn't fraud didn't think there wasn't fraud and people who thought there was might thought it really what I thought might happen is it would reduce it in Maine, um, but not elsewhere. And actually, we saw the opposite, right, is that we already had so much confirmation about Maine. People were already participating in Maine government in by just being a citizen. And sort of maybe that's one of the reasons they think about it as less possible here. Um, but yeah, no, I'll say it, it was surprising and really exciting because of how hard it is to do that. Thank you. Oh, I love it. A um, couple of, of, I think, quicker questions. What kind of a time commitment are most poll workers doing per election? Like, what does it take in terms of hours or training? Um, so I can weigh in on this. It, it probably varies from community to community. I've done a ton of work here in Orno um, uh, over the last gosh, I guess the last three election cycles, we've worked with the town of Orono to rec recruit students to serve as poll workers. Um, what we typically ask is um, there's training, right? And so that's typically like a two hour training. Um, increasingly, we've been doing that through Zoom. That used to be in person, but increasingly it's happening through Zoom. And then um, typically you're asking for a six to eight hour commitment on election day, although we've been a little bit flexible with that. 
um, letting people kind of, you know, duck out, especially students, duck out for two hours, come back, or if somebody can do um, a half day, then that's fine. Um, so to the, the elect the polls themselves, um, that process starts the night before in you know setting up the polling place, at least for some of the larger polling locations, and can carry forward actually um, several weeks as we update voter registration info. So um, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can be involved. It doesn't necessarily have to be that public facing role at the polling place on election day, but that can be um, helping send out or process absentee ballots. That can be helping enter voter registration info after the election is over. Uh, that can be, you know, lugging chairs and setting up tables. So um, what I've found is that most town clerks, because they have to be, are pretty um, nimble at figuring out what people can commit to and figuring out ways to kind of involve them in the process. So even if it's the case that you can't bag out of work for six hours and um, you know work at a polling location. There's probably ways that you can be involved. But I would re reiterate what Jordan said is that like we should all be thinking about ways within our workplace, uh, within institutions of education, uh, and maybe even via policy that uh, it can become something that people engage in, that it doesn't necessarily um, uh, preclude you from participating if, if you have to work on election day and maybe you can get a paid day off or something like that. But um, the takeaway, I think, is that there are all sorts of different ways that you can be involved and to reach out to your um, municipal clerks and they'll figure out a way to put you to work. I love that. That's a that's good to know, too, that it doesn't mean you're you don't have to commit to saying hello to everybody in your town in order to be helpful. <laughs> uh, what and and so many of us have local we have local elections coming up in June. Um, what? Are town clerks recruiting now? How far, how far out are they usually putting together their their dream team for election day and and the days surrounding? I, I can hop on that one too. Um, typically, uh, town clerks and, and municipal clerks already have their dream team, uh, so they have the the people that they go to election after election. Um, and that they count on. And, um, but there, um, yeah, you can reach out to a municipal clerk at any point and just kind of give them your name and your contact information and they will add you to a list um, that they'll contact. The way that we've done it here is usually um, we're doing training for folks um, about two to three weeks out from election. And by that point, we have a list, kind of a tentative list that's always changing and shifting of who's going to be serving in what roles um, on election day. So, you know, if it's a November election, if you were to reach out to your municipal clerk in September or even late September, or heck, even, you know, the, the week before an election, they'll figure out a way to get you involved. But if you give them a little bit of notice, uh, it probably ratchets down their anxiety level and they can um, uh, plot you into a, a schedule or a spreadsheet in a way that'll work for you. That's really good advice. And uh, just that mention of the the stress that our town clerks experience around elections. I'll just put in a plug for taking them muffins, taking them thank you cards, smiling when you walk in the door. Uh, I know they do, they really do incredible work and um and making sure that we were show our appreciation for that. Uh, can go a long, long way towards making their, their work more sustainable for all of us. Um, Rob, you mentioned training students at the University of Maine to, to serve as poll workers. And that got me thinking, what other kinds of innovative programs have you seen schools doing at the, the college level? But, but also, I know most of our high school students can't vote yet, but boy, are they a captive audience. <laughs> What are we doing to get them better, better engaged and more civically minded? Um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways. Um, here at the University of Maine, we've um, we've really focused on that that poll worker role, and um, a lot of you know, there's obviously there's political groups on campus that are are trying to mobilize people to vote on certain issues or for specific candidates. 
Um, but all of the work that we do through the university organization is nonpartisan in nature. And so we're recruiting students to serve as poll workers. There's kind of an ulterior motive too, that like I try to recruit a pretty broad base of students um, to serve as poll workers because there is no better way to learn the mechanics of voter registration. And part of the other work that we do besides from, uh, beside from uh, just working with the town is, is also a big push on uh, student voter registration. So those students who have served as poll workers also become uh, the people that we tap to register students to vote. Um, so I know there's lots of work like that at universities. Um, Jordan might have a better sense. I know that the, the Bangor um, city clerk was working with the Bangor High School and their um, civics teacher. So we see this work, I think even, you know, filtering down to the high school level. Yeah, I don't know the details of that uh, relationship, but I know that there were several Bangor High workers as well as other high schools in the Bangor area that were serving as, um, as poll workers. I learned about that because uh, in order to participate in our project, they needed to be 18 or over to consent to participate in the research. And so I got people saying, well, I'm a high school worker, you know, can I, so, um, you know, it, it, it really opened our eyes to creative things that clerks are doing. Um, but Kathleen, mean, you mentioned, you know, things in schools, but I also, and we have, I have, I don't know examples of this, but I often think that like many towns, especially some of the smaller towns in Maine have municipal organizations, fraternal organizations, other sorts of groups that are in parades, are in all sorts of other things. And it makes sense to me for, you know, if you happen to be a member of one of those groups, one of the things those groups can do to help serve the community is to participate in things like this and to reach out to town staff and and offer support for election day and beyond. I'll, I'll add that Waterville High School was the, uh, the same thing. And I discovered it when I went to vote and I saw a bunch of my friend's children greeting like, oh, hey, Carrie, how's it going? Um, but it was through, um, they actually had a formal organization. So the students were trained at the high school and then brought in and they worked throughout the day. I mean, they were incentivized. They got to miss a day of school to volunteer at the polls. Um, and got some type of community service credit. They had a certain number of hours they needed to work. I love that. And I love this conversation. And I hate that it's after one o'clock because I could talk to you, the three of you for, for hours. So thank you so much um, to Carrie LeVan, to Rob Glover, to Jordan LaBeouf. You are, are wonderful, brilliant researchers. And I wish I were taking your classes because you're also really good at explaining all of this to us. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Keep your eyes out for that follow-up email later this afternoon and feel free to forward it to anyone and everyone you know so that we can, can spread the word. Uh, we will be back in this space next week to talk about something very different. The uh, it problem of bird glass collisions. Don't worry, our friends at Maine Audubon have a plan. They'll be here to share it with us next week. Hope to see you then. Have a great weekend. Thanks again. <laughs>